Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be back here. Actually, even though I was born and raised in Texas, both of my parents are from North Carolina, so it's always a treat when I come back. Reminds me of all the trips we made as a child driving across from Texas to North Carolina. So thank you. I want to um, I want to set a brief personal context. When I uh, grew up in Texas, my dad used to take us to Sunday school. And when I got to college, I would have told you I was a Christian, but I actually wasn't. Um, and I, I'll kind of explain that later in the evening. I began to get interested in actually justice issues when we when I, as a teenager we worked. I was with a group of people and we uh, worked putting on parties for people at the mental hospital. So we would actually put on dances. And uh, then I got interested in the feminist movement and then in the civil rights movement. And gradually I became increasingly drawn intellectually to more and more radical sort of intellectual uh, work on justice. So I eventually ended up pretty much in critical theory, which is, pretty, uh, which is Marxism, multiculturalism, cultural studies, radical feminism or womanism, which is a recognition that the feminist movement actually was very white. And then um, in, social, in social constructivism, those of you in the humanities would call it structuralism and post-structuralism. Well, in my personal life, while I was going that way intellectually, I was also uh, becoming increasingly adventurous in my personal life. So um, I used to frequent nightclubs and discos. <laughs> okay, don't laugh, you're just jealous. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I was also into alcohol, drugs, and I would say then. So. In my spiritual life, I was uh, moving toward pantheism. By the time I got to graduate school at the University of Texas in Austin, um, I was within two weeks in transcendental meditation classes, and then I did Buddhism, um, almost anything as long as it was uh, not Christianity. Finally, I was bending spoons, which in California counts as a religious activity. <laughs> um, so I used to tell people I was spiritual and not religious, and now I'm going to kind of confess what that meant. Uh, when I told people, it was usually a Christian I told this to, uh, that I was spiritual and not religious, what it really meant is I'm actually better than you. Because I don't really need a God to be good, and I don't need any rules. And sure enough, I made up my own rules, and they got weirder and weirder. But... Um, that is, that's really what I meant. I meant I was like connecting to this universal spirit in, in the world and I didn't really need a religion. Well, in November of 1992, I was 41. I had just received full tenure in the university in May, and this is November, and I have this unshakable dream where I remembered every single detail in the dream. Jesus figured prominently, and it showed the, me the condition of my soul. And after that, I began kind of searching, uh, asking different people, especially uh, a Native American man who had been in, the only man to ever take my radical feminism class. <laughs> Happy to report he's still alive. <laughs> um, anyway, he, I, I talked to him, and I, because I thought, when I, really when I woke up, I just remembered that the dream, I thought spiritual dream Native American. And that's why I asked him. Turned out he was a Christian. I thought I was on my way to a sweat lodge, so <laughs> which was fine with me. But so uh, about a year later, I was at a month, a year after I began to sort of look at uh, seek Christ, and actually I gave my life to the Lord in a Methodist church in Glen Alpine, North Carolina. I bet none of you know where that is. It's close to Morganton. It's right outside Morganton. It's a town of about 300, uh, where my mom was uh, born and raised. So I began to hesitantly explore Christianity, hesitantly because I was a professor, I knew what the university thought about that. Uh, I ended up at this monastery seeing this video, I'm going to show you a brief click of, clip of that in just a second, because I realized that you were probably about five years old when Mother Teresa died. So I'm going to show you this clip so you can see what their work looks like. But at this monastery, I saw, when I saw the clip, Mother Teresa said, our work is not social work, it's religious work. And I thought, okay, now that I'm exploring Christianity, I kind of need to know what that means. So I wrote a letter and asked them if I could come and work in a, on a sabbatical uh, the next semester. 
And uh, they wrote me back, and this really jolted me, because in my letter I said, if you allow me to come, what should I bring? Now, to be perfectly honest, I'm a pragmatist, and I was thinking toilet paper. <laughs> and they wrote back and said, all you need to bring to Calcutta is a heart to serve Jesus in the distressing disguise of the poor. And that's because of the scripture where Jesus tells his disciples, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me to drink, I was naked and you clothed me, I was lonely and you came to me, I was sick and you tended me, I was in prison and you visited me. Um, and then the disciples said, when did we ever see you like this? And he said, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. And so I think you'll see that in this little clip. This is when they were in Beirut. Seriously, Mother Teresa said, oh no, Mr. Hamid, uh, I'm certain that we'll have the ceasefire tomorrow. Well, he said, if we have the ceasefire, I personally will make arrangements to see that you go to West Beirut tomorrow. I think we should take full advantage of the fact that we have a ceasefire of sorts. There were 60 totally deficient. Um, spastic children in a centre. There was no staff really left to look after them. 
the hospital itself has been hit by shells a number of times, a number of people have been killed. I would like perhaps to take you to see this case and then we can see what can be done. We have not been able to find a solution to this problem of the Muslim children. At that time, um, and I'm being very candid here, I was not clear in my mind at all uh, of what practical help she could be. We had no water and no power most of the time. We were running out of just about everything. A saint was not what I needed most.
Well, this is what their daily work actually really looks like. Um, here was a woman who was the founder of a worldwide ministry, a multi-ethnic ministry all over the world to the poorest of the poor. I actually had always professed to support all those things, work with the poor, women in leadership, multi-ethnic organizations. But she had never made it into any of my class syllabi, not my justice syllabi and not my feminist syllabi. So I began to have to ask myself this question, these questions. Was it because she was a Christian? Was it because she was a Catholic? Was it because she was a nun? Was it because she was against abortion and um, good feminists shouldn't be that? Was it simply because she just talked too much about Jesus? Why hadn't she made it into my class? Most people interpret Mother Teresa as simply a good humanist, actually maybe even an extraordinary humanist. And I actually tried to come when I came home to speak and write about her in a sort of soft, secularized kind of Christianity because I knew what my colleagues in the university would think if I didn't. But she didn't really live her life that way. I was actually lying about her. Todd Lake, who was at Harvard, the day Mother Teresa was the graduation speaker, writes like this, and this really explains my dilemma. He said, I remember Mother Teresa's speech on the steps of Memorial Church at the Class Day exercise in 1982, where she talked of Jesus incessantly. I mean incessantly. And even quoted that verse, John 3:16, already known to most of us thanks to the signs in the end zone bleachers. And now Tebow, I guess. <laughs> but in a triumph of brilliant editing, Harvard Magazine's account managed to report the entire Mother Teresa speech without once hinting that she might have even mentioned Jesus. We all sensed he could be trouble, and we wanted to make sure he never became a live issue again. But Mother Teresa called herself a pencil in God's hand. She believed that they could not do that work, and you can imagine how it's just physical labor over and over you do the same things you clean people you wash diapers you you cook you feed children like that she believed she was a pencil in God's hand and that the work that we saw was actually not their first work their first work was to belong to Jesus and to pray unceasingly and one of the reasons that you saw so much peace in the two different settings is that they actually have a requirement that they're not supposed to speak unless it's necessary to do the work. They're supposed to be praying all the time. So when that sister is working with that child, she's actually praying. So the stamina, the grace, and the strength uh, came from Jesus, who Mother Teresa said gave them a big push from above. So eventually I stopped. I had to admit I was lying about her, and I stopped trying to exorcise her faith. So how did Mother Teresa actually decide to do what she did? She was originally a middle school uh, social studies teacher in a Catholic school in Calcutta. She was the sister of Loretto. Did she just like feel sorry for the poor all of a sudden? Or was she angry about the social justice injustice she saw in India? No. Mother Teresa had had three mystical visions of Jesus when she was 36 years old. She began the ministry when she was 38. In these visions, Jesus was speaking to her from a cross. He told her he wanted her to do four things. One is to develop an order of Indian nuns who could work with Indian people. Prior to that, most of the, um, the orders in the Catholic Church uh, were largely originated, origi originated inside Europe or uh, the United States. So she said that she told one of her bishops that Jesus didn't want them to have to become men. He didn't want the Indian women to have to act like European women. Second, Jesus wanted them to go into the deepest, darkest holes of the poor because he loved them and he had no one to take him there. He asked them never to build an institution where the people had to come to them, but to, uh, to, to go to the people themselves. Third, Jesus asked them to live in poor communities and take on poverty. Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity called themselves living sacrifices. And they did not think everybody needed to do this, but they knew they were called to this. And fourth, they were called to serve just the poorest of the poor. So it's not surprising that when they got the ceasefire, they went after the people that no one else would go after. So they didn't serve the poor that other organizations would serve. They served the ones that no one would serve. And in fact, we used to buy water from a man down the street from the mother house 
the volunteers did. And every time you'd go to him and he'd find out you worked at Mother, you were working at Mother Teresa's, he'd say, "Ah, oh, bah, she needs to let those people die. India has too many people. So how did they fund their work? Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity actually never took money from either the church nor the government. Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity believed in radical divine providence and radical forgiveness. And the story sort of combines those two things. Um, Mother Teresa believed that as long as ra divine providence is, as long as you're faithful to the call that God's put on your life, Basically, Mother Teresa believed it was God's job to bring the money that they needed and the resources that they needed. Well, while I was there in 1996, which was about a year and a half before she passed away, Christopher Hitchens, the Arch Atheist of America, came out with his book on Mother Teresa, and he called it The Missionary Position. Prior to that, he had actually had come out with a film at the BBC called Hell's Angel. I knew she knew about the book, and I knew she knew about the film because one of the sisters had told me about it, and she's actually quoted in the book remarking on the film. Well, one of Christopher Hitchens' compl many complaints about Mother Teresa was that she took money from the politically incorrect or the politically corrupt. Now, let's just think about this. Mother Teresa and the Missionaries of Charity do not read the Wall Street Journal or the London Times or any other financial newspaper during the day. They believe that the, that the money is, is sent from the Lord, and so they gladly just cash it and use it. Well, I read Hitchens' book while I was there, and I had an occasion. One of my jobs at the center I worked was as a runner to the mother house. So when I would run materials down there or to go to pick up materials, that's, that was every, every single one of my about five real encounters with Mother Teresa happened then. So I'm sitting on the bench, and uh, an Indian priest is there also, and she's telling us this great news that these students from the uh, university had ra raised some money and they were dividing it up against, uh, amongst different uh, ministries for the poor. And she, they had brought her some. And she was very excited because she had started a new ministry to prostitutes. So she would get the prostitutes out of jail and she would put them near some of the permanent sisters and the permanent sisters would um, teach them new work. I guess it's the best way to say it. <laughs> um, and as she was telling me this, I had just read the book, so I'm thinking, okay, I know she knows about the book. So anyway, I said, I, I pushed her a little bit. I said, Mother, there are people who write books about you that say you don't need any more money, that you have a lot of money. And she looked at me kind of quizzically, and then she looked, then she, you could see she sort of recognized what I was talking about. And she said to me, oh, the book, it matters not, he's forgiven. Well, that didn't stop me because he knew she had said that about the BBC <coughs> film, and he was not very happy about it. So <laughs> I needed to tell her that, I think. <laughs> I just wanted to see what she'd say. So I said, well, Mother, he knows that you said that you forgave him, and he's kind of angry about that because he says he didn't need to be forgiven, and he didn't ask you to forgive him. And then she looked at me like I didn't understand, and she said to me, it's not I that forgives. It's God. God has forgiven him. Go ask the sisters. So when I went back to my place, I asked, and I found out that the permanent sisters, those are the ones that wear the blue stripes, and it took nine years. You had to be in the Missionaries of Charity nine years to get the, all the blue stripes. But the permanent sisters had had one little tattered copy of this book, and they had agreed to pass it around to all the permanent sisters, and they would all read this book, and then they would come together when the last person read it, and they would fast for a week, and seek the Lord for why the, what the book's message was for them. Okay, and so I said, so what did, so what would you find out? And the sister said to me, oh, it's a call for us to become more holy. Now, I have to admit to you that Christopher Hitchens has never done that to me. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that, I have a long way to go. But Mother Teresa believed in radical forgiveness, the kind of forgiveness that Jesus preached from the cross as they're hanging him there, and uh, not a single person around there knows they need to be forgiven or has asked to be forgiven. And that's one of his last words, is that his father forgive them, for they know not what they do. So all these vile things were being said about, written about the missionaries, and they forgave. And, the, and when they forgave, they didn't have, I, this is the way I would describe it, they didn't have any hooks left in them. There were no hooks to kind of catch them or to, to sort of damage the work. 
I heard a pastor once say that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, unforgiveness, I bet everybody in this room knows somebody who has not been able to forgive something. And their, real, their life is really limited. In some cases, they're physically or even psychologically ill. So in Judeo-Christianity, radical forgiveness of another person is a basic psychological principle. But there's another side of forgiveness that helps us become more just and righteous. And the reason that this is important is that biblically, from a Judeo-Christian standpoint, justice and righteousness cannot be separated. So a lot of times it says things like justice and righteousness are the foundations of his throne. This equally radical, maybe even more radical principle of Judeo-Christian forgiveness is that if we that we need to confess our sins to God, and once we do, then we're not only just forgiven, but that God begins a process of cleansing us from whatever it is inside of our soul or our spirit that makes us do this or makes us want this thing. And this is a spiritual transaction. It's not a psychological one that you convince yourself of. Much of the injustice in the, in the world starts with the unrighteousness inside individual people, inside ourselves. I think Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was a Russian novelist and political dissident in Russia, when he was in the gulag, the prison um, the st that Stalin had built, here's the way he describes, right, right as he begins to have actually his conversion to Christianity, he ultimately was an Orthodox Christian. He says, in the intoxication of youthful successes, I felt myself to be infallible, and I was therefore cruel. In my most evil moments, I was convinced I was doing good, and I was well supplied with systematic arguments. And it was only when I lay there on the rotting prison straw that I sensed within myself the first stirrings of good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, not through classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart, and through all human hearts. And even in the best of hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. It is impossible to expel evil from the world in its entirety, but it is possible to constrict it within each person. So I'm going to give you a personal example of, the, uh, forgi of being forgiven. When I became a Christian, I began to grieve over two abortions I had had. And I would confess them over and over. When I got to Mother Teresa's, I had been a Christian about three years. And she and I just went to the volunteer table and said, I'll work anywhere. And honestly, I thought they would uh, put me with the home for the dying because that's where the adults were. And I figured that the children, uh, other, a lot of people would want to work with the children. But they assigned me to work with babies. Actually, they assigned me to work with sick and handicapped babies. So I, I worked in a center very much like the one they set up here in Beirut. When I returned from Mother Teresa's, I was at a monastery again. And um, Father Sam was um, giving a lecture, a, a preaching on forgiveness. And he asked us to make a card. And on the front of the card, we were to list anybody we thought we hadn't forgiven. And on the back of the card, anything we wanted to be forgiven for. So I list, made my list of people I felt I hadn't forgiven, and I made the list on the back, and the top of that list was my, my two abortions. And I began that afternoon, we were going to burn these cards at night, like a prayer to the Lord, on an outdoor altar. So um, I'm walking along the river, and I hear, this is not something that happens to me ever, except for this one time, but I hear this voice inside my spirit, I would say inside my spirit because I don't think you would have heard it if you were walking next to me. And it was a man's voice and he was pretty unhappy with me. And the voice said, who are you not to forgive someone I forgave? And I thought, okay. And I walked along and I looked at my list and I heard it a second time, same tone, same words. And then I heard it a third time. Finally, I just knelt in the grass, I looked up at the sky, and I said, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I forgave you the first time you asked, and I don't want you to ask me again. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, he was just telling you to forgive yourself. He actually wasn't telling me to forgive myself. He was telling me, you don't even have the authority to do that. 
I've done it. It's just me. <laughs> I did it. It's all over. And you just keep sort of hanging on to this. Self-forgiveness is a secular psychological principle. It is not a Christian one. I, and I, I read the whole Bible the next year, the one-year Bible, looking for any instance where anyone forgives themselves or is told to forgive themselves, and it never, ever happens. So while scriptures had assured me I had been forgiven, I was still trying to work it off until I felt like I might deserve it. So while working it out, I might feel free one moment and not free the next moment. So if forgiveness, as, Judeo as it's described in Christianity, is true, if God actually forgives us and cleanses us, then secular psychology is at best limited. Now I want to read to you a, a, a piece of a study that's probably one of the best of secular psychology. Because secular psychology has become very interested in forgiveness. And in fact, there are some studies now of forgiveness and, and pe people who believe they've been forgiven by God. One of the largest studies is by a man named Krauss, and he's done several different kinds of analyses on it. But here is the conclusion of the statistics in one of his uh, studies that came out in 2003. This is just about the statistics. But I want you to notice that he uses the word feel instead of know or believe. <coughs> okay, so he says, this is the conclusion to the statistics. Older people who feel they are forgiven by God are approximately two and a half times more likely to feel that a transgressor should be forgiven unconditionally than older people who do not feel they are forgiven by God. Okay, so that's their statistics. That's what they actually found. But now let's look what they do when they try to summarize their study. Here's the major paragraph in the summary. Finally, as noted earlier, official church doctrine advocates forgiving others and seeking forgiveness from God. Yet we know relatively little about how these theological issues are brought into practice in daily life. Who knows very little about that? We actually have known things for 2,000 years about this. Two intriguing leads are provided in the literature. First, a recent study by Wuthrow suggests that small formal groups in the church, such as prayer <coughs> groups and Bible study groups, may promote the forgiveness of others. Second, research indicates that the general psychosocial climate of the congregation may have an important influence on thought and behavior of church members. Because the general psychosocial climate of a church is likely to affect the way prayer groups and Bible studies are run, Comparing and contrasting these institutional influences may provide valuable insights into the factors that encourage people to become more forgiving. What do you notice here? God is completely eliminated from their summary. These people, the, these authors, either they, they do not believe that there could have possibly been a spiritual transaction between the people they study and a living God, regardless of the fact that that is what their participants told them. It has all become reduced to sociology, the climate of psychosocial community groups. It is not God who has forgiven them, but psychosocial communities that have healed them. This is a perfect example of what Dallas Willard, a philosopher at USC, calls the calamity of displacing the central points of Christian knowledge into the domain of mere faith, sentiment, tradition, ritual, or power and power. Well, when I um, when I got ready to leave to uh, come back uh, to the United States, I was sitting on a bench again and uh, waiting on some materials. And Mother Teresa walks out from her office, and um, we're just it's just the two of us, and she's standing, and I'm sitting, and we're eye to eye. We're the same height now. <laughs> That's how tiny she was. And she looks at me, and she starts pointing her finger at me. Now, everybody says to me, wasn't Mother Teresa sweet? No. <laughs> I mean, you can see in the film, right? I mean, she was sure there was going to be a ceasefire, and it's like she wasn't going to stop. So um, anyway, she was strong. She was strong. She was brilliantly, you know, Christ-like and centered, but, uh, but she wasn't sweet. So she said, she walked up to me and she said to me, um, God does not call everybody to work with the poor. And then she said to me, 
God does not call everybody to live poor like he calls us to. And then she said to me, but God does call everybody to a Calcutta. And she pointed right at my chest and she said, you have to find yours. Well, I mean, it, it felt like I had actually been physically hit when she said that. So obviously I remembered it. And when I came back the next fall and started teaching and started trying to write about her in a sort of secular Christian way, almost secular Christian way, I, I fell into a really deep intellectual crisis because I realized that what I was, I was still teaching the same thing I'd always taught and my mind had actually gone somewhere else and I felt like I was actually lying to my own students I, by, at least by excluding this one worldview. So I knew I had found my Calcutta. And so I began to then have to feel like I needed to study worldviews and I began to see worldviews in sort of three, uh, other than Judeo-Christianity, in sort of three categories. One is scientific naturalism and philosophic materialism, the idea that everything is just a thing and everything's a material phenomenon. Secular humanism, the idea that man just decides how to make himself and makes himself because he's in this angst and he, because of this anxiety, he has to make these choices and every choice you make makes you. Or pantheism, the sort of Buddhism, Hinduism, and things that I was in. And I began to realize that from any of the worldviews I had been teaching or living, Mother Teresa was actually completely incomprehensible. There was no way you could actually describe the real Mother Teresa through any of these worldviews. From the perspective of scientific naturalism, um, Mother Teresa was just a unique bundle of brain chemistry with particular psychoneural chemical processes going on. From secular humanism, Mother <coughs> Teresa just decided on her own, with her own human reason and power to do what she did. She just decided to take on that responsibility and she had enough determination and, um, and fortitude to do it. Both of those worldviews would have added the caveat that it was unfortunate that she held this myth of God, myth about God. To the naturalist, the myth about God is just a genetic or psychoneurological fluke that is destined to uh, disappear in human evolution. And people have been saying that for many years, and they're pretty upset that it hasn't happened. <laughs> From secular humanism, it would have just been like a wish fulfillment. She created this God because she needed a God. Now, no one has ever explained to me why you would create a God with rules if you wanted to just create a God. <laughs> it seems like it would just be somebody who just liked anything that you did. <laughs> uh, that, or maybe from secular humanism, it was just the tragic result of a poor Albanian education. Or a cultural idiosyncrasy of the way she was raised. Or the worst uh, interpretation would be a Marxist interpretation that would suggest that she actually used Christianity as an opiate to make the poor happy with their existence. From pantheism, Mother Teresa would have just been a more highly evolved soul and maybe even more highly reincarnated. She would have been connected to this divine universal spirit in, in the world, but she would not have had a relationship with a real living God. So Judeo-Christian Christian, um, Christianity has unique insights into, for example, issues of justice. For example, I already mentioned the inexplicable connection between justice and righteousness. Every time you look at the, the uh, Bible and the kings of Israel, the ones who were righteous were also always just. Second, Judeo-Christianity has a non-utilitarian view of human beings as being made in the image of God and thus sacred. And that's why you find in, in Judeo-Christianity, uh, you find uh, a lot of uh, pushback on abortion and euthanasia and assisted suicide and sort of selecting your child after you've got the genetic code uh, mapped down. In fact, there was a recent uproar in the last two, uh, in the last two weeks, I think it was the week before last, that um, because a medical journal in Europe, a real medical journal, uh, people suggested that there was no reason, reason that you couldn't make, that the post-abortion killing of children was fine, that parents should just decide. You know, I didn't get what I want or I got what I want. If you didn't get what you want, you just have, you, you actually killed the child. Third, um, in Judeo-Christianity, there is a body, and we're all like little cells in that body, 
And interestingly, the least is actually as important, if not more important, actually in scripture, more important than the strongest. So Martin Luther King actually summarized this whole passage, which is 1 Corinthians 12, by saying, for some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are who you ought to be, what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. That is the way God's universe is made. So pluralism in Judeo-Christianity means that all people come together. So how do, how do you pull these, this sort of global community together? You pull it together because it has one head, and the head is Jesus Christ. That is why, this is why I was not a Christian. I'll tell you why I was not a Christian, because in Judeo-Christianity, Christianity is a choice that everybody has to make. So just because my father took us to Sunday school did not mean I was a Christian. So Christianity has nothing to do with your culture, unlike other religions. You can be born a Jew, you can be born a Muslim, you can be born a Buddhist, you can be born a Hindu. You cannot be born a Christian, and that's why the phrase for, born, that Jesus uses, born again. And lastly, and well, this isn't last, actually, but you heard Mother Teresa say one, two, one, two, one, two. You just pick up one, you pick up the next one. She told me, and this was really important, I think, for your calling, because you're all thinking, okay, what is my calling? What, what is my purpose in life? She told me that if God had told her his real purpose for the missionaries of charity, the whole purpose, she would have been too afraid to pick up that first person she talked about. She wouldn't have picked them up because she would have been afraid. She would have thought, I can't do that. So she wouldn't have even started it. Um, it's not just a role of a government in Judeo-Christianity. Mother Teresa worked with the government in Calcutta because the mayor had a morning that he allowed people to come and tell him things that were going on in the city. And she would always be there to report, well, this part of the city doesn't have power, or this part of the city's water line is broken. Justice is also always related to forgiveness. So you look at the Rwanda incident and the sort of reconciliation that's gone on there and still goes on there. Or you look at the incident of the Amish a few years ago when their um, young girls were killed. Another principle is that the anger of man, and this always comes against Marxism, the anger of man never produces the justice of God. So that is actually scripture in James and ultimately there is a justice, and you have that in this parable about the rich man and the poor man in heaven. In Judeo-Christianity, and this would have been uh, something that um, Christopher Hitchens might have wanted to know, actually there are several places where it suggests that money that's gotten through corruption actually will ultimately end up with the poor. So it's actually not surprising that she got a lot of che checks from corrupt people. That's in Proverbs 13. And in Leviticus 18, you take neither the side of the poor nor the, uh, nor the rich in, in uh, justice issues. And the last one, and maybe the most important one for what's been going on in the university and the social sciences, is that the term is never equality. The term in the Bible is always equity. I work in very poor schools in Los Angeles, so I've studied highly effective teachers in the worst schools in Los Angeles. They're the lowest performing schools, they're in the middle of the projects, and, um, and there's a lot of really awful teachers there. But those students in those schools actually need more. They don't need the same thing everybody needs. They actually need more, and they need better teachers. But I won't get into that, because <laughs> I won't get off of it. <laughs> and I'm trying to wrap up. Okay. So here's what I want to suggest that for your generation, the question of the 21st century is this. Is reality secular? Is reality secular? That's really the question. Because if reality is not secular, and if it is actually, if, if things really are, according to the way that the Judeo-Christian story and uh, knowledge plays out, then the university is missing a lot because the, what, what Charles Taylor calls the hegemonic master narrative of the last couple hundred years in the West has been secularism. So everything's become secularized so that actually Judeo-Christian thought doesn't even get into your classes or your textbooks. But that's your question. And here's what Dallas Willard says about that. He says, is reality secular? Is adequate knowledge secular? And is that something that has been established as a fact by thorough and unbiased inquiry? 
Is this something that today's secular universities thoroughly and freely discussed in a disciplined manner? Certainly not. Nowhere does that happen. It is now simply assumed that every field of knowledge or practice is perfectly complete without any reference to God. It may be logically possible that this assumption is true, but is it true? I believe that the radical secularization of the university and of the West has led to four major problems that are bankrupting the university and, and the culture. The first problem is that we're woefully ignorant of what most people believe. Only about 5% of the world could you call secular. That is, people who don't believe in some kind of spiritual framework, of religion or spiritual framework. So we, we actually don't even really study that, except maybe if you take a sort of religion class, a multiple religion class. Second, secularization has radically diminished the university's commitment to unbridled search for truth. So secularism denies the university its place to be the, that it's always believed it held, to be the free and open marketplace of ideas. So if there are certain ideas that can't come in the university, then it's no longer the free and open marketplace. Third, it contradicts the university's own self-professed commitment to uh, pluralism. So it's not really pluralistic. <coughs> and lastly, Stephen's, law professor Stephen Smith says, it's left the university with a thin, desiccated public discourse. He suggests we need to decriminalize the smuggling of beliefs. So the bottom line is this. I, I teach only PhD students. It's the last degree they're getting. It's in a secular university. And my issue is generally just, just our justice issues and teaching issues um, in, uh, in poor schools. But I want my students to understand all of the options for thinking about the issues that they're going to have to face in the next generation. And for you, I would want the same thing for you. I want everybody to be fully conscious. So I still teach Marxism, but I also teach the Judeo-Christian view of what it would look like for education of the poor. I want, um, I want everybody to be fully conscious of what their options are. And then you can choose the option that you believe fits most with reality. Because what Mother Teresa taught me is that what you believe and what you disbelieve makes an enormous difference. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to stick around, we're going to have a question and answer session. So feel free to just raise your hand and say the question loudly so Dr. Pavlin can respond. Actually, Mother Teresa hardly, I, I, I don't think they ever work with a Christian in India because, they're, first of all, there are very few Christians. Um, they work primarily with Muslims, actually. And uh, Mother Teresa did believe, does believe, that every, well, Judeo-Christian Christianity would too, that every person, every human being belongs to God and is created by God. Now, she was in, because she was in India, the only reason that the, the, the um, when the, English were kicked out of India. Um, they, the Catholics were allowed to stay, probably because they did most of the education and a lot of the health care also at the time. And they were told that they could do anything but proselytize. So they couldn't proselytize. And she really did believe that as long as pe when people would see the truth, they would go to the truth. I mean, she believed that. And there, there were some uh, conflicts between them and the Hindus, especially the Hindu people who kind of owned the temple that they used for the home for the dying. And um, the, actually the communist governments told the Hindus that if they would turn the, use the temple for the same purpose, they could keep it, otherwise they couldn't. So there were all kinds of things going on. I guess it's a major question for me, because I was raised by my dad's Hindu, my mom's Lutheran. Uh -huh. So I mean, I've always grappled with whether or not you know Christians believe that Hindus would be saved. 
Well, in Orthodox Christianity, everybody has to come to Christ. I mean, right? And um, you might want to look at C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man, because in the back he has an appendix of all the common things across religions. He really kind of he studied a lot of them, all of them. And there's a lot of common commonalities. Like in, I think it's Buddhism, it could be Hinduism, uh, there's a, a principle that says you don't, don't do to other people what you don't want done to you. In Christianity, that's do unto others what you do want done to them, which is a little bit more extreme. And then when Jesus comes, he says, actually, um, do good to your enemies. So that's even more extreme. But So he, he does show some of those things. Um, the thing about different religions is this. They can either all be wrong or one of them can be true. But even the Dalai Lama says, eventually, after you start your spiritual journey, you have to choose one. Because Buddha will not take you to the same place Christ will take you. And I think that's, you know, the truth is every religion thinks theirs is the best. I mean, it's not, this is not a, a single, <laughs> this is not something that you can pick out for Christianity, including secularists who believe that their faith is, is, is the best. Thank you. She's actually coming to clear my next week. <laughs> um, you talked about kind of the secularization of culture. I was wondering, historically, when do you see that kind of coming into play? Like, what are the where where are the roots of that? Okay. Um, it comes about around the Enlightenment when science is doing really well and everybody says, okay, has a lot of enthusiasm and optimism for human nature being able to kind of take over and do what it wants to do without, without rules. And um, Dallas Willard um, poses kind of an interesting hypothesis that like Hume and Kant and all those philosophers around the Enlightenment, they were Christian, but they wrote in a way, they were trying to make Christianity secular, thinking that you could hold on to it and turn it secular. And then, of course, what happened is you couldn't. Without getting rid of the divinity of Christ, uh, without sort of seeing God as a, a sort of separate but not active being. Uh, so, And the other thing I would say is that something I just sort of, I, I, because I'm writing another book, I, I kind of stumbled on this. All the other religions, uh, like Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, they all occur, they, well, except for Islam, which is later, but um, they emerge, like Confucius, Lao Tzu, uh, Buddha. They all emerge in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, which I, I don't know what that means, but I just think it's very interesting that it happens then. Uh -huh. um, so you, you come, obviously, identify as a Christian. Sounds like perhaps before you identified as a feminist. I'm curious to hear whether or not you still identify as a feminist. Okay. Or not. Well, when I got to college, like I said, I would have told you I was a Christian, but I really wasn't a Christian at all. And I didn't even really know what it was. I don't really think, uh, I guess I shouldn't blame it on the church. It was probably, I just didn't understand. But I don't really know that I was ever told the gospel, ever taught the gospel in all those years of church. But, um, do I consider myself a feminist? N not really, except that I, I know that God called me and I'm a woman and he has a place for me and I know he called Deborah and Esther and you know all the, people, all the women in the Bible. So I guess I would say I'm not a feminist because I'm not insecure about it anymore. So <laughs> I think when I was a feminist I was pretty insecure. And uh, I just believe God calls different people to different things. And, and he makes a way. He opens doors or he closes doors. You know, like I was at a Veritas forum um, recent, not, not too long ago. And uh, I was going to speak in a church. And then I guess, I don't know, maybe the person didn't know that Professor Popham was a woman or something. But anyway, they took back the invitation. But, you know, why get into anything? Honestly, um, to fight those battles instead of staying focused on your call and your destiny is... I, I think um, pro problematic, I guess, is what I'd say. Now, did the feminist movement have to 
the original suffragettes and things like that. Most of them were Christian. I mean, if you look at Sojourner Truth and people like that. Um, yeah, I think people had to be awakened. I think there had been rules that would have kept Deborah from leading whatever she was called, or Esther, or any of these people. And um, I think if you, look, when I look at the New Testament, I'm fine with it. I mean, Jesus' longest dialogue with anybody in the Bible is with a woman who was like me, the Samaritan woman, right? As far as I can tell, it's the first person he actually says to her, I am the Messiah. Um, so, and she's not only a Samaritan, but a sinner. <laughs> and a woman. So, I, I just don't, I guess I've lost my uh, yeah, concern about that. I think we have, I think as women or men, because right now, if you really look at the statistics, for example, the education statistics, men are much more vulnerable right now in this culture than women. They're doing much worse in elementary, starting even in elementary school. Everything, in, on any measure. You look at prisons are filled up with men. Um, we're, we've got a culture that's got a crisis for men, actually, right now. Uh, secularists, I guess, would view faith as like a limitation like, to reality, but... Uh, they, they view faith as a what? I'm sorry, I missed a that. A limitation. Word. A limitation, yes. Uh, to rea reality, but for us, it's like a bridge to justice from reality. Right. But how would you say justice play, uh, or faith plays a role in, I guess, bringing justice and reality together, and not just by divine providence, but like, from... Right. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. But if I don't, ask again. Raise your hand. Um, I think first we have to we have to say we have to know that secularists also have a faith. It depends on which secular group we're talking about. If you're a, nat a scientific naturalist and you believe in scientism, um, you have a faith that everything in the world can be reduced to a natural phenomenon. Now, that's something you cannot prove as a naturalist because your own methodology only begins after the identification of natural phenomena. For secular humanism, they have a faith that people can be good without God, without any moral boundaries, and that people can live choosing their own moral boundaries, and you can actually have a society that functions that way. And uh, I think that, um, and so for Christian Christians, our faith is that there is a God, that he's in three persons, and um, that we are forgiven and all this, and, the, and justice is tied to righteousness, and it is a reality. And I think that any of those worldviews has to prove that what they believe is real. And I'll, I'll just use the psycho, uh, the sort of chemical, the naturalist argument for just a second. Um, the naturalists believe that there's, like I said, there's nothing but natural phenomenon, material phenomenon. Now, I actually don't doubt that after I became a Christian, that my <coughs> mind changed. That you could have probably, if you had scanned my mind for all those things they scan brains for these days, um, and before I came to, to Christianity, and now, you would find a very, very different brain. And the reality, I hate to admit this, but the reality is I was a fully tenured professor at an elite private university in the United States, and I could hardly think myself out of a paper bag. Like, I had all kinds of beliefs and assumptions that didn't even make sense when you put them together. Now, the saddest part of that, and that's actually biblically predicted, I mean, my, the state of my mind is actually revealed through scripture and through reality. But, um, but the saddest part of that is that nobody noticed, not very many people noticed. Because that's kind of the state we're all in. We've all grown up in a, a pretty radically secularized environment where people will say one thing and another thing in this, almost in the same paragraph and you'll look at them and you'll think, didn't you just say the opposite <laughs> two sentences before? So um, I think that's, I think, but I do believe that you could actually see differences in my brain. The differences in my brain, however, did not cause the change in my life. God changed my life, and my, the differences in my brain were a result of that. 
And if you can't understand the whole picture of natural phenomenon and spiritual phenomenon, this is a real danger in the West because the church has not dealt very much with spiritual phenomenon either. But when you separate those two things, then you, ha then, then you have no spiritual discernment. And all the culture then can operate on is either in terms of moral issues or uh, ethical issues, and like justice, is votes. You either have votes or you have the power of those elite in, who are in charge. And they're whatever they believe at any given moment. And there's a lot of uh, uh, movements even in philosophy like Jürgen Habermas or uh, Amitai Etzioni to develop a new moral code secularly. The problem is how often does this have to be redeveloped? And how do you establish a, a stable culture on something like that? Uh-huh. Okay. The student did not share his faith with me. Uh, that was the Native American student. Okay, so he was older than I was. He had taken my feminist class. He was still alive. <laughs> and um, here's what happened. I had this dream, and I thought, okay, Native American, spiritual life, dream. That's what I thought. Okay. So I called him up because he had offered to help me with my spiritual life. And prior to that, it had been pretty irritating because it seemed obvious I was doing a lot of things with my spiritual life, right? Spending spoons, after all. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, so I called him up and we met for dinner. And honestly, for a year, even after I told him I had become a Christian, he didn't tell me that he was. I think he knew that if he had actually revealed the fact that he was a Christian, I wouldn't have called him. But, I be but I'm certain that he prayed for me for eight years before all this happened. So, it, prayer, prayer works. Works like Mother Teresa said, prayer words. Somebody else? You guys have great questions. Uh huh. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned in the that you're not, they weren't allowed to accept the problem. Right. believe that anybody who knows any religious framework should really teach what that religious framework looks like in that whatever that field or that issue that they're teaching on is. Um, no, I don't, uh, I don't tell my students they all need to come to Jesus. Um, but I think what happens is you just, you're known and then if somebody wants to know something, they come to you. So I've had a lot of students come to me for help, students who were maybe once Christian and then they weren't Christian and, and they want to know when. And I, I do, ever, about once a year, teach a specifically Judeo-Christian class. In a PhD pro, in the PhD program that I'm in, students don't have, they don't have any required classes. So they cho just choose. So I'm teaching a class that's actually going to be a transdisciplinary class this fall on uh, Judeo-Christian principles and other worldviews, which kind of comes off the work that I've been doing. I think, um, you know, everybody proselytizes. <laughs> you know, I mean, whatever their worldview is, they want to convince you of it. It doesn't matter what it is, even if it's like, I love this television show and you have to watch it, right? <laughs> so um, so I, th I think there's more going on when people attack Christians about that. I, I can tell you that you know, I used to always join people who said that Christians were, you know, mean and all that stuff, but I had never experienced it really. The reality I think we have to remember is that is what C. S. Lewis said, and that is that every Christian is not going to be better than every than a non Christian. I mean that's just kind of silly, right? So um, but what what Lewis said, which I think is important to remember, is that Every person who comes to Christ will be a better person than that person would have been had they not come to Christ. I think as a Christian, that's all we can say. I can say to you, 
I am a much better person and I am much safer on the streets <laughs> to other people <laughs> than, I was, than I was 20 years ago. I was kind of like an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> if you meant me. Uh, um, you kind of close the equity versus quality can of work and mm -hmm. you open it back up and say, well, you think it's important. Okay, tell me how. Tell me you, what you you're sort of talking in education, uh, difference between equality and equity. I think mm -hmm. it was Right, right. Mm -hmm. And you kind of said, oh, I don't want to get into that. I think that you're just going to take you down. Oh, oh, oh when I. Okay. I'm sorry, I sort of want to give you permission to go on the rabbit trail. So. Okay, I'll go on the rabbit trail. Okay, first of all, I think the important... Okay, so this comes from a realization. I read the Bible once as an educator, like a year as an educator. And, of course, education never appears in the Bible. That's your first problem. But <laughs> nevertheless, there are a lot of other things that appear. And one of the interesting things that appears is that the word equality is only used once in the Bible. And it's when Paul says that Jesus didn't consider himself equal to God, right? Okay. All the other times, it's equity. Every parent who has, who's, well, every parent would have children, right? Every <laughs> 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 child uh, knows that you don't that to be good, a good parent to different children is to require different things. Like I have three sisters, and my parents didn't treat us equally. And if they had, it would have been a mess, you know. So, um, so what happens in, in equity is certain, certain people, every, I believe everybody's called to a destiny. Even, even a retarded person who's in, a, like a seriously retarded person in a family serves a part of the destiny of that family and themselves. And, um, and that in order to fulfill this destiny, you have to have certain things, and you have to have certain things accessible. The sad thing in uh, poor communities is these, if, if the schools remain as bad as they are in many, many communities, these children will never have an opportunity to go to college because they won't be prepared well enough to go to college. So in that case, we really do need to do something. I mean, Here's where the Marxists actually are right in this particular piece, because all of the worldviews that are secular or even pantheistic, they have some overlap with the worldview principles of Christianity. And here's one of the worldview principles that overlaps with Marxism in education. There's a principle called social reproduction, and it was a man named Pierre Bordeaux made it popular in France uh, not, not that long ago, about a half a century ago. And what he said was institutions inside a culture tend to be organized in such a way that they reproduce the classes. So that institution treats poor people in such a way that when they come, when they, after they go through that institution, they're only prepared to be poor. And that's what's really happening in inner city like Watts in, in Los Angeles. The schools are so bad that the only job you could get when you get out of high school is McDonald's, right? Because you, you don't know anything else. Um, so that's where, that was my rabbit trail. Did I go down it enough? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for letting me go down that trail. <laughs> I just finished the study of 31 high-performing teachers that I mentioned in low-performing schools. And the really interesting thing at the end, I was not even going to, I had a, te a research team of nine people. And we never planned to ask them about their religion. But in the last two interviews with the teachers, we would say things like, we watched these teachers for a year, we would say things like, um, why do you, um, what do you do if you have a child who's just really not make, getting it? And three of our teachers spontaneously said to us, well, first I pray for them. Oh, well, that, that's kind of odd because, you know, I'm from a secular university, they're in a public school, that kind of takes sort of crossing a boundary that's not usually crossed. And then I'd say things like, one of the questions was, why do you teach? And we had a different three people say, well, I know it's a call from God. That's why I teach, you know. So we thought, well, maybe we better check this out. And what we found is that over half of them were Christian. Half of those were Catholic, half were Protestant. And when we, um, and then we said, okay, so ask everybody, what's your, do you have a spiritual framework? And we gave them all kinds of choices. Every religion, there was one Muslim, one Jew, 
and um, 17 Christians and I forget, maybe eight or nine, I sort of lost track, of people who said they were spiritual and not religious. Okay? Then we said, okay, so how important is that? Only two people said they didn't have one. And then we said, so how important is that spiritual framework to the work that you do? And three-fourths of them said, marked it the highest. So you know, there are reasons that we don't know because we don't ask, I guess. Uh-huh. Uh, you said at one point in your life that uh, I something along the lines of really didn't like rules. Uh, I didn't what? Like rules. Rules. Uh, yeah, I didn't like rules, right. <laughs> well, what, do you, what do you feel about rules now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, I think they're necessary. Okay. I think they're necessary. I think the problem with believing that we can all make our own rules is eventually you're rule runs into somebody else's rule. Stephen Smith in his uh, book on, I forget which book it is, but uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book called Disenchantment of, the Sec of Secularization, and I think it might be in that one. He said the problem with uh, individual freedoms is that to grant freedom to the, for a lot of freedom to the pornographer is to take away the freedom of people in a community to raise their child in a pornographic free community. So eventually, these things begin to collide, and um, and personally, I believe that most nations, and certainly the West started with Judeo-Christian uh, principles, but I think that Judeo-Christian principles and rules are probably end up producing the most freedom of any that you can have, while still giving some kind of guidelines so you don't like do what I did and that is steer off the mountain over the guardrail, over the non-guardrail or something. And I think it's very, it's, and, and Jürgen Habermas is an atheist who actually supports Christianity uh, and works uh, a lot of times in dialogue with uh, Benedict and others. And Benedict's probably the best critic of secularism. But Jürgen Habermas really does have this kind of romantic notion that human beings can, reasonable, Human beings can come together and renegotiate these um, boundaries, whatever they are, whether it's moral, ethical, psychological, political, whatever. They can just continue to reshape these. I think that's just wildly utopian to believe that people, it, what it reminds me of, it's like this nightmare of being caught in a town hall meeting for the rest of your life. <laughs> like everybody disagreeing for the rest of your life. So I think. But I think that a nation has to decide on a framework. So uh, if in India they decide Hinduism's their framework, that's what their laws will be built around. I mean, just, you know, even though Hindus might not be, this might not be like a theocracy, like, but it is in this one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.